Okay, welcome uh, everyone. While we wait for the others to join, um, and we're still a little bit ahead of schedule, I would like to um, just share with you a poem recited by Ron Bob Semple. Um, Ron um, is, is well known to many Guyanese um, uh, and actually started participating in our programs about a year ago um, and sadly passed away last week. So we're dedicating this program to him. Um, and uh, we'd also like to begin with um, his rendition of a poem by Ivan Forrester, um, which I think you'll enjoy. Um, so just bear with me while I start that. Our next poem is by Ivan Forrester. Ivan Forrester, born and educated in Bovis, was not a man of the city or the coastland. He was most at home in the interior of Guyana. A voice from Cuffey's grave is read by Ron Bob Semple, thespian and broadcaster. Ron? Through dark jungles of subjugation, through itching swamps that drown the soul, through white streets of fire and hate, through alleys of sweat and blood, through labyrinths of conceit, I walked, wobbling in perplexity and groaning under the burden of servitude, with my head bent low, sniffing at the dust that blew from the prison of my soul, seeing only the puddles at my feet, filled with the blood from my own veins and the sweat from my own brow. I walked feeling not the heat of a kind of sun that blistered the ebony back, crisscrossed by the lashes flayed by the rise and fall of the tail of the devil, but only the hurt that oozed from dark abyss of memory and the unbearable longing for the end of years. I walked through the long distance of years and years of misery, scratched and itching from the blade of the sweet grass, fertilized by my blood and bones, blinded by black chimney smoke that mocked my freedom and stole my laughter hearing far away as in a dream, the beat of drums, where I heard my own song and heard laughter like sweet music, where my soul roamed the heavens and my being was a slave only to my own will and to my own God. And then I raised my weary bloody head and found again my pride as I stood there erect and noble and with my right hand raised and clenched, I saw them standing there then I heard their silence, dead silence, born of the cowardice of a bully, born of a colorless, soundless, weightless void, a silence begotten of bubbles, bubbles that burst without a sound, bubbles filled with air, free air, nothingness in a void, scarecrows on whose shoulders birds repose, elephants that lumber off at the sight of a mouse, tall giants that feel the bite of an ant. They make their noise in silence and beg, to be heard. Silence? Why don't you speak? Color, where is your tint? Atlas, where is your strength? Proud bubbles all along, I knew you floated not on a cushion of air, but trod upon dry bones and upon dry blood. But listen to the voice of the oracle of the jungles. The salt of my sweat might have flavored your mess of pottage, but my bones, though, are your taunting memory. But my blood and my battered pride may yet seek a vengeance, a vengeance! For my dark journey is ended, and I can see a faint glimmer in the sky, and a dark hand reaching, reaching for the sun. Thank you. So uh, that was um, a reading by Ron Bob Semple. 
um, almost a year ago. Uh, and we're showing it um, as a form of tribute to him. He passed away um, about a week ago. Um, warm welcome to uh, everyone who has joined us. Um, and to those watching on uh, Facebook. Um, I'm going to start the program now. It's a short program um, of readings and poems. And then we um, invite um, uh, anyone who'd like to, to say um, a few words um, about Ron or to read a poem um, or any other um, form of tribute. So good afternoon, uh, everyone, um, uh, and welcome to this, our first event in 2022. Um, this is the first of a new series. Um, it's essentially a short program of prose readings and poetry recitals featuring mainly Guyanese poets and writers. For any newcomers, Moray House Trust is a private, non-partisan, non-profit based in Georgetown and dedicated to promoting Guyanese culture and public discourse. My name is Isabel de Caris. I'm the Chair of Trustees at Moray House Trust and your host this afternoon. Please note that the event is being live streamed via Facebook. If you're on Zoom and would prefer not to be visible, please turn off your video, which is usually at the bottom left of the Zoom screen. <laughs> Tonight's event is dedicated, as I said, to the memory of Ron Bob Semple, whom we lost suddenly last week. On behalf of the Trust and all of the other readers who have worked alongside Ron in the past year, I'd like to extend condolences to his friends and family. And as I said, we invite anyone who wishes to pay tribute to him uh, to, uh, at the end to share a poem or a memory um, or a reading with us. This evening's readings dip into the work of Jan Carew and our poems are drawn from a treasury of Guyanese poems, which was edited by A.J. Seymour in 1980. The recital has been pre-recorded and uh, I, I'm going to play the recording after which we welcome comments and questions. Grandfather was born in 1869 in the village of Good Hope on the Quarantine Coast. Cousin Maria, the tireless family chronicler, told me that once you go past the immediate family lineage of mother, father, grandmother, and grandfather, it's like walking blindfolded down the roads that lead nowhere or trying to reconstruct branches of a tree that lightning split into broken pieces. What Aunt Louisa told me before she died is that Stephen Arminius Robinson was the son of Roderick Robinson and a Carib woman named Yeti. Roderick was a dark-skinned Creole from Good Hope, while Yeti was a Carib from Akio in the Northwest District. How the two of them met, I really don't know. But Roderick was a restless, itchy-footed man, and he could have strayed as far as a hero when he was prospecting for gold. The truth is, though, that Roderick bit off more than he could chew 
when he married Yeti because she was a Tantaria of a woman who didn't fear God or man. Yeti had brains, ambition, and drive. On top of all of that, she had more than her fair share of good looks. Educated by the Jesuits in Akiru, it was she who saw to it that Sar, her one child, got a good education. But as bad luck would have it, she and old Roderick never lived to see their son become the youngest schoolmaster in the country. They both died in a boat accident on the Borbis River where she was a balata trader and a timber merchant. Louisa's first child was already on its way when Sar was appointed headmaster of the Westland Methodist School. He also served as a lay preacher and eventually became the founder and president of the National Church Association. The NTA not only dealt with job security, training, and teachers' rights, it was, in addition, a seminal anti-colonial organization that openly raised questions of universal adult suffrage and home rule. Because of his courage and his renown as an eloquent speaker, even after his retirement, the village of Agricola continued to treat him with a reverence that bordered on awe. When Stephanie and I returned from the United States, grandfather Stephen Aminius Robinson, or Sar, was so delighted to have two of his grandchildren in Agricola once more that he insisted on our accompanying him on his afternoon walks thrice a week and in all seasons we walk from the family house to the outskirts of agricola and only turn back when we came to the narrow village lanes that ended in trails leading to overgrown pastures sugarcane fields and irrigation canals the color of born sugar what i remember of those walks was that villagers treated grandfather with a reverence that bordered on idolatry. And as we walked past them, the men tipped their hats and the women bowed. For his part, grandfather nodded or waved in response. All of this did not interrupt the flow of his conversation with us. Sometimes he would ask us about our experiences in America. But most of the time, he talked to us about the village and its people. Once, when I had gone back on a short visit, I remember how I crossed the public road and moved further into the village, and how the sound of traffic and the blare of transistor radios became muted. My mind's ear once again picked up the sound of grandfather's deep, resonate voice. And I remembered how in those early days, that voice used to shut out those rival songs of church bells, Hindu temple bells, the high pitched call to prayer from the cupola of the Shihide Muslim mosque and of six o'clock bees humming like the wind in high tension wires. The songless rhythms of drums was always in the background, exorcising anguish and matching the hard beats of listeners, Shango drums, Afro-Brazilian Macumba drums, Shihide Muslim drums that increased their tempo month after month until the sacred day of the Taja, when a symbolic replica of the coffins of Hussein and Hassan was committed to the river. Then there were Hindu drums, Amerindian drums, and the drums of a dozen millenarian cults born of immortal longings. In addition to their seven children, grandmother and grandfather had adopted seven orphans from the village. 
Cousin Maria told me repeatedly that all 14 of those young people brought up in the Robertson household feared grandfather while they practically worshiped grandmother. Whereas Sar was a stern and inflexible disciplinarian and no one dared disobey him openly, Louisa was gentle and with her subtle and refined intelligence managed to spur them on more effectively than he could ever have done by himself. I wanted to escape from a hiker, but I couldn't. My grandparents wrapped themselves around me and I knew no way of fighting against their feebleness. Sometimes I wished they were dead. And yet the thought of living without them frightened me. Brave boy, Tante Moore's son, had escaped. He walked to the city, 20 miles away, he did not return. I had been to the city once with my grandmother. It was a place with too many people whom I did not know. I knew everyone in my haika and in the neighboring villages. My grandmother's eyes searched my heart at times, ferreting out my longing to be free. Old age turns people into vampires. They must feed on the young, shut them up in rooms, breathe the same air that they breathe, claw at their young limbs with dried up hands and gloat over their innocence. Mahika was a bowl axed out of swamps and forests on a river bank. In front of the village was the sea and behind the wide savannas. There was a wooden bridge across the river and when cartwheels rumbled over the loose planks it sounded like thunder. A burnt brick public road led from the city through the village and across the river to other settlements along the coast. Mahika was my prison but I was safe in it. They said that people starved in the city, but here in Mahaika, you could find fruits, catch crabs where the mangrove roots tangled by the seashore, fish in the river and in the swamps, and if you were rich enough to buy a gun, hunt game in the savannas. At the back of the village were rice fields, small provision farms, coconut groves and patches of busy busy and wild cane reeds. The low front lands were made useless for farming by the invading salt water. And here, saffron, corida, and mangrove grew wild. I wanted to escape, but I was afraid of going too far from the sound of grandma's voice. I heard it first thing in the mornings and last thing at night crackling like dead leaves. I always thought of my grandparents as phantoms in a twilight world. Grandpa was a shadow and grandma a wraith. They were the children of slaves, the offspring of a waiting people who had lingered in forests for millions of years. They wanted to hand down this heritage of waiting, but I would have none of it. They felt time like a river running through their blood, but I wanted to feel it like passion flaring up swiftly and dying away. Darkness had set in and the claim holders had won for the trail before they left to get ready for the fete. Bulla arranged it so that Tonic and Woody should take turns to guard the shop. He lent them his German rifle and told them to keep a sharp lookout because he had enough gold and diamonds in the shop to buy half the country between Morawana and Akarai. Four paraffin lamps brightened the hill and lit up the surrounding forest that night. The women arrived first, dressed in gowns made by the best dressmakers in Georgetown. 
and wearing so many diamonds, it looked as if they had strings of fireflies around their necks and arms. They sported lame, silk, and satin gowns, and some of them had gold tiaras on their heads. They came from the slums of Georgetown or the coastal villages originally, and yet the famous courtesans I had read about had nothing on them. White men, sailors, and civil servants had been their best clients in the city, but the pork knockers were kings compared to them. They weren't fussy about spending thousands for one night of pleasure. The men trooped in later, dressed up to kill, in silk, satin, salara, or fine linen shirts, those skin flannels, broad belts inset with diamonds, and two-toned shoes. The clay boulders wore silk scarves around their necks, and diamond-headed pins arranged in the shape of crosses or hearts gleamed on the scarves. Belle came out when the fete was on the way. She wore a white sequin gown and champagne-colored shoes. Around her neck was a half-moon necklace with a single hundred-carat diamond burning like white fire against her black throat. The musicians sat on a platform of boxes covered with red cloth and the wore garlands of tiger orchids. The women circulated amongst the crowd of men showing off their gowns, but the men commented more on what was under the rich cloth and made their bids early. Before the music struck up, Bullard jumped on the platform and held his arms above his head for silence. Ladies and gentlemen, he shouted joyously, tonight is a great night for all of we. Me never thought me could be so happy. Tonight, we all gather here to celebrate the birthday of the Queen of Perenong. The guest shouted and stamped and Bullard raised his arms again. His Solara shirt was open to the waist and his dough skins looked as if they had been poured like hot latex over the bulges of his buttocks, thighs, and calves. Ladies and gentlemen, he continued, the queen bring me all luck. She make Peranong a place to sing about again. Bulla, she say to me the first day she set foot here. Bulla, she say, me feel good luck in my bones. And from then on, ocean sharks start rooting up diamonds like fire. And now, Money passing from hand to hand like strippedness. The band struck up and we abandoned ourselves to sustain ferocious gaiety. At midnight, Santos called and bell to sing. He was in a boisterous mood, boasting about his wealth and dancing and kissing the women. Let me have a song from the queen, he shouted, jumping up to the platform. And the pork knockers stamped and cheered. Bell stood in the center of the room and sang Marchita with only a guitar and a flute accompanying her. The guest fell silent as she sang. I knew she was singing only for me. Her song brought back memories of life on the coast, moonlight nights, sitting on doorsteps, listening to Piper Owls flutting, the surf pounding up beaches, dogs barking and children crying and Voices talking with slow, easy cadences. When the song ended, violence broke loose afresh. The pork knockers lifted Bell to their shoulders and Buller with drunken tears running down his lined face bawled. Me never see an angel till tonight. Sing, queen, sing to me and me will give you every last board in my shop. I signaled to the musicians to stop playing and mounted the platform. Ladies and gentlemen, I shouted, and my head felt as if I were floating up the rafters. Ladies and gentlemen, this is part of the Queen's birthday present. I pointed to four cases of champagne at the foot of the platform, and the crowd made way for her. Bring a wash tub, she said. And when Woody had done so, she slipped out of her gown, kicked off her shoes, and stepped into the tub. Woody handed her an empty mug, which she used as a dipper to pour the champagne over her naked body until she looked like a polished wood carving in after She stepped out of the tub 
dripping champagne, and the crowd opened for her to pass, feet rooted and eyes staring stupidly. One of the musicians behind me muttered, a thousand dollar bad partner. The other women, not to be outdone, took turns to have a champagne bath. A few of them were so drunk that they splashed about in the tub fully clothed. A barbaric shouting burst out of the cottage, swelled and echoed through the forest and re-echoed over the hissing and droning of the grass fall. Face Tapestry by Annette Warren Rollins. Vital faces, suffering faces, evil, smiling, senile faces, Madonna faces, Mephistopheles faces, faces of Diana, faces of the world, ebony face of imperious caste recalling a throne of lions, skins, and tribal chiefs in splendid robes, hearing the adulation of eloquent drums. Passing now by Silver Valley face, reminiscent of the wisdom of the ancient East of Confucius, pagodas, exquisite jade. Buddha transplanted to the West among mahogany faces, inscrutable as the mountain rock, impenetrable as the deep forest from whence they emerged as silent, suggesting Kanaima. I and Ghana, El Dorado, the golden one, gold flashing from another face, worshipper of strange gods and tempers of intricate design, redolent of haunting music and the Taj Mahal face of eternal woman, expressing maternal fulfillment, mingled with anxiety for children with upturned faces who question. Ever they seek to unravel the mysteries inherent in existence from sympathetic paternal faces. Woman, man, child, mahogany, ebony, Silver Valley, melange of all and more, sharing equally in the benediction of Guyana's son. Weaving a history of life, of history, of continuity in the infinite flow of faces. The Peasants, a poem by Roy Heath. The people plow the land, but do not own it. Their children see the land, but do not inherit it. Labor beneath the ruthless sun, broiling and burning, though the skin bears no fruit, but yet, it is better to die on rich brown soil than in the street. These noble peasants who know the pure and simple life suffer from this rare knowledge and forever kissing the hem of destitution, they live with green fields of rice and pasture sown with the rich dung of contented beasts. Like a tree so arched by the wind that its crown would kiss the grass, so seem the figures of reapers that gently roar the silent earth. Fortitude in a shattered shirt when the sun retires and dusk 
draws her blanket over the land. They skirt the dance, these pillars of dignity, to homes of peace and hope. And after the rains, a breath of wind brings a pungent scent of steaming earth, and trees give up their fruit, and the harvest is garnered. Usman Ali Charcoal Seller by Ian MacDonald. Some men have lives of sweet and seamless gold. No dent of dark or harshness mars those men. Not Usman Ali though, not that old charcoal man whose heart I think has learned to break a hundred times a day. He rides his cart of embered wood in a long agony. He grew rice and golden apples years ago, made an ordinary living by the long but sure, laughed and drank rum like any other man, and planned his four sons' glory. His young eyes watched the white herons rise like flags and the sun brightening on the morning water in his fields. His life fell and broke like a brown jug on a stone. In middle age, his four sons drowned in one boat of a pleasant river. His wife's heart cracked, and Usman Ali was alone. 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 Madness howled in his head. His green fields died. He burns the wild wood in his barren yard alone, sells the charcoal on the village to coast, and feasts on stars at night. Thinness makes a thousand bones around his scorched heart. His moon-scarred skin is sick with boils and warts. His grey beard stinks with goat shit, sweat and coal. Fire and heated dust have roared his eyes to redness. They hit like iron bullets in my guts. No kindness in him. The long whip smashes on the donkey like iron. The black and the brittle coal has clogged his chest with dirt. The black fragrance of the coal is killing him. He is useful still. I shake with pain to see him pass. He has not lost his hating yet. There's that sweet thing to say. He farted the beauty of the rain-dipped moon, the smooth men in their livery of success. He curses in his killing heart and yearns for thorns to tear their ease. His spit blazes in the sun. An emperor's bracelet shines. Meditations of a man slightly drunk. I came and they drunken me lightly with a medley of liquors. There was Falarnam. There were literary disagreements, poetical dissonances, yes, but chiefly there was run. They talk to me of stanzas, the ancient and the very modern. They broached even painting, haggled about form. Over Epstein concorded with reverence, yes, but chiefly there was rum. We jabbered of pendulums, pendulums that swung like my vision. They gesticulated and bawled, ranting about matter, eulogizing imagery, yes, but never forgetting the run. We slashed at Swinburne, and we justly kicked old Kipling, 
we grimace dreadfully of a terror. How we had pulled on and sniffed at Rupert Brooke, though always, always, mind, there was rum. Oh, man with the tie for a brain. It is regretted that though you have the honor to be the obedient servant of people and prime minister, though you bounded eager and annoying out of school to claim that valued honor, life for you holds no tomorrows, only yesterdays of precedence and seniority leading luckless and inevitable to a last lingering put away. Me and Melda by Mahade Das. When I throw the remarks at she, she ducking. She playing like she shut your ears that she hear. But as God above, if I lie, slap me down this minute. You can bet the frock you got on. The portals as she is wide open. At the blood running red man through your brains. And she grinding your teeth, biting back your tongue. Cause she can't win now. And wait, wait for the moment when she got blasted her back <clears throat> in the palm of your hand. Then, hey girl, she gonna tear out your hair and dig out your eye. When she done the bitch, she ain't gonna be good for no man. Hallelujah Song of the P.I. Man by Henry W. Josiah from a treasury of Guyanese poetry. Aya, 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 aya. I'm a singer of songs, redresser of wrongs. I lead the long dance of Imwali. I dance for six days. I sing for six nights. I raise the men's gaze, dreams of greatest delights. Honey flowing from flower to bee. Aya, 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 aya. I call spirits of mirth from aqua to earth, swinging hammocks with children asleep. My music I air through tiger bone flutes. My dancing despair like cassava uproots. Where are beds of dead ones, none will weep. Aya, 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 aya. Makanaima's moonbeams now brighten my dreams from his faraway home in the sky. My song is our prayer, my dance our beliefs. Sing to be gayer, dancer of all our griefs. Rising by moonlight, lie in sun's eye. Aya, 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 aya. Put paint on your faces, wear armbands, necklaces, wear leaves of the Ite palm tree. Advance without care, wife, child by your side, hands empty, feet bare, we've nothing to hide. Rise up and come singing with me. Aya, 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 aya. Call forest and mountains, savannas and fountains, of rapids and drought time or flood. Make trumpet of hollow Congo palm tree. Come here now, come follow, come dancing with me. Life leaps out from you like new bud. Aya, 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 aya. Like hummingbirds beak to the honey I seek is my trumpet's bright blast at the dawn. My spirit flies upward to aqua near sun. In trance, my limbs quiver till six days are done. Ends dance. Now begins Wallaban. Aya, 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 aya.
for anyone who joined us a little later, um, uh, we've dedicated this program to Ron Bob Semple, who passed away last week. Um, and I should also mention, I think the, um, the Guyanese Cultural Association is doing um, uh, an event to honor him on Sunday as well. Uh, yes, they are. Hi, uh, this is Jasper. Good day, everyone. Um, <clears throat> like you, uh, the news of Ron's passing was it, 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 it's that thing that death does to you. Where um, I mean, you know, you know, it's not a joke, but it, it's you kind of somewhere hoping that it's a joke. Um, I never actually met Ron. When I joined the Theatre Guild in the late 70s, I had heard of him and I only um, moved in the same circle, I guess I is safe to say, when I moved to the United States in the early 90s. We spoke on the phone, in fact, a few years ago when I was contemplating moving to Florida, he did link me with his realtor um, to talk about finding uh, a house down in, in the Tampa area. The closest I got to him was being a co-reader on one of the Ganis, uh, 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 on one of the Murray house um, reading sessions. And it's I, I, it was my honor to share the same bill, if you will, with him. And I remember, you know, listening to his reading and just being wowed by it. In fact, I think one time I shouted so loudly, I might have had to be muted after I heard one of his readings. What a voice, um, what a talent, what a, what a, what a craftsman. Um, missed, definitely missed, our, our, our voices in silence. Um, but as I, heard someone say once um, you only truly die when the last person who remembers you utters your name so if that is true um, he's going to be around for a long long time and that is I mean we're only richer for it and uh, um I'd just like to read uh, I know this is the go-to poem for most Guyanese, especially when someone in the arts passes away, but it is so apt. So if you're going to bear with me, Death of a Comrade, Martin Carter. Death must not find I can do this. Death must not find us thinking that we die. Too soon. Too soon, I will ban a drape for you. I would prefer the banner in the wind, not bound so tightly in a scarlet fold, not sodden, sodden with your people's tears, but flashing on the pole we bear aloft, down and beyond this dark, dark lane of rags. Dear comrade, if it must be, you speak no more with me. nor smile no more with me, then let me take a patience and calm. For even now, the greener leaf explodes, the sun brightens, stone and all river burns. Now, 
from the morning vanguard moving on dear comrade i salute you and i say death will not find us thinking that we die i'm sorry May, may I say a few words? Um, and Jasper, we, we grieve with pride and we cry with no shame. And I'm proud to say that I knew our brother from our youth. We were high school students together at Central High. I was a few years ahead of him. And in those days, a few years made a big difference. I always said to him, I'm the long ball, long pants boy, while you were still the short pants boy. In those days, um, one wore long pants or short pants, depending on what class or form one was in. When I heard of Ron's passing, for, for days I did not add my sympathies to the various pages that, that popped up on Facebook, for example. And it occurred to me that I didn't do it and I couldn't do it because in my spirit, I did not accept Ron's passing. I do so now reluctantly and I agree with Jasper and all others, we have lost a great voice. What I liked and admired about Ron was not only did he represent the best of the Caribbean arts and culture and Caribbean history because it's his portrayal of, um, of Marcus Garvey is a historic, is a historic um, achievement. But I realized as I thought about Ron over the last few days that Ron was so warm, so embracing of people, so friendly. He in effect affirmed us even as we tried to affirm him. Um, no one envied Ron. And that has always surprised me. Uh, we didn't envy his talent, his skill, his accomplishments, because we saw we saw those things as our talents, our skills, um, our accomplishments. Um, it's seldom that when a voice is silenced that the, the silence speaks so, so loudly. But this is one one occasion when the death of a comrade will forever ripple through our memories. And I agree with you, um, Jasper, that even beyond that last person who remembers him, Ron will live forever in the histories of, 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 of the Caribbean people, the histories of, of the liberation struggle, the histories of humanity coming in, into its, its own. Um, Fare you well, Ron. Um, we'll have to survive somehow. We'll have to continue struggling, but we, we pledge, at least I do, to continue the great work that you have started, the work of perpetuating the arts, the work of, the work of perpetuating the future of, of all peoples. Fare you well, Ron. Thank you. Thank you for that. Stan. Um, it is always very moving to see somebody who is so struck um, by the spirit that it comes through in the way they speak and their expressions and everything else. Um, I'm about to say something that will probably be shocking. Um, in the late 1970s, thinking about death, the idea came to me that from the time that we are conceived, we have begun to die. In other words, what we call life is really a long living death. And from my own personal experiences, I know that there is another dimension that exists and therefore death is not an end. It is a passage, it is a passing. Uh, over the last three years, I have had to write codes 
um, to the press about six friends of mine. Um, four of them were very, very close to me. The others were not, but they were all artists. And I decided that I had to write about that because I know that, um, that where art is concerned, um, the work doesn't reach people as far as much as the work of writers. And for some reason, it's probably something about British heritage. We seem to pay more attention to writers than to artists. And I remember the Caribbean artist movement, which was started around 1966 in England with Anne Wamsley and the rest of them, that um, Aubrey Williams made such a statement that he said that um, more attention paid to writers than artists. And um, two writers responding to him said, that is true. And as writers, we do not have or understand or have the capacity uh, to write about art. But it says something about the nature of our educational system. You know, because we teach people to, to read and write and stuff like that, but the, their, their introduction to the visual arts, not to make artists out of them, but at least to allow them to realize that there is another form of expression that is available to them. And that visual arts in its, in its way is another language. Um, my mother died, my father died. And um, excuse me if I read this poem, it's called De Profundis. I did not cry when my father died. Instead, a picture was painted. I did not cry when my mother died, but paid a visit to the silent sea. Death is as expected as it is unexpected. And that holy surprise cannot really be shared. But as I left the sea, I was suddenly reminded that the salt of my tear and the salt of the waves were the same. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any other comments or tributes um, to Ram or indeed any other comments generally? I think there's been a slight confusion with the times. We've we've had quite a few people joining in the last few minutes. So um, just to explain to them, we're actually nearing the end of this program, um, but you will be able to see it. It'll go up on the YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to see it it's in, in its entirety if you've missed any bits. Um, we began the program um, with um, uh, Ron Semple reciting um, a poem by Ivan Forrester, who's actually one of his favorite poets, um, in a quite masterful fashion. Um, and I think we will conclude um, uh, with that. Um, I make no apologies. I don't think you'll see many better readings of a poem. <laughs> Um, but uh, if there were any other questions or comments, I'm happy to hear those. Um, May I? Yes, May I? please. Isabel, I just wanted to say how wonderful it was to hear something about Yan Karu. I'd wondered for quite a while, where was he? What was he up to? I remember meeting him back home. I, somehow we were like on the beach somewhere, daddy was walking and talking to him. And that's my one really strong memory of him. So this has been quite a pleasure for me. Thank you. Me too. Here I am in sitting in Cold Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And to meet all these wonderful people. And when I was a young girl in Guyana, Buxton, I used to read about these great poets and writers and stuff. 
and to know how many years have passed, 50, 60 years have passed, uh, I, my heart is beating and swelling with joy. And I thank you guys that I'm going to watch out for my Guyana news. And when I see anything like this, I'll be part of it. Thank you. God bless all of you. Oh. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you. I would just like to say that uh, when I heard of uh, Mr. Bob Semple's passing, it made me feel really sad. Because as a young Thespian, we always look for opportunities to be inspired and to learn from those who would have set the path for us. And in 2020, I was looking for this and I was so happy that I, 2020, sorry, was so happy that I found it um, in celebration of our Golden Jubilee. I was part of a production producing um, Jubilee Voices, an evening of drama and spoken word poetry. This was held on Monday, February 17, 2020 at Durban Park. And Mr. Ron Bob Semple, in fact, Uncle Francis Komnafari wanted to um, do one of his plays, The Slave on the Scroll. And Mr. Ron Bob Semple was the cast member of that, um, that play, as well as he also did an excerpt from one of his own pieces, Remembering Voices, if you look. Um, Carefully here, you will see his name on the program. And so um, I count it a privilege to have had that brief interaction as part of the production team for that production. And um, to have had a very, very short conversation with Ron Bob Semple. If there was one thing I would have loved to do was to have witnessed his performance, um, his famous Marcus, Marcus Guy um, solo production. That would have been something I would have, I know, Thanks, Keon. Thank you. So I'm I'm not sure, and I, I can't venture, but um, it's possible that at the Guyana um, Cultural Association event on Sunday they may have some footage of 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 Ron's work. I mean, it's quite extensive, so you know, one hopes that they they'll be able to show um, something. Um, but uh, a very sad start to the year for us. Um, and as I say, we do extend our condolences to his family and friends. Um, uh, on a slightly more upbeat note, um, before we close, as I say, again, with uh, Ron's recital, um, we will have um, our second outing of the Guyanese Love Poems um, on Valentine's Day. Um, and if anyone would like to contribute a poem um, or to read, please do um, uh, email us or get in touch with me or wait till the end of this performance uh, and have a word with me because we're going to start recording those next week. Um, so uh, we need to move fairly swiftly uh, on. And then we hope to do these sort of much shorter recitals, um, probably monthly, um, you know, uh, going on through the year. Um, so happy to hear any suggestions or any other favorite uh, uh, novelists or poets or anything like that that you think we should be um, we should be focusing on. Um, thank you very much. Um, we're delighted um, with the with the turnout and very happy to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, and as I say, we're going to um, to end as we began. Um, so with Ron Bob Semple. Um, reading uh, a poem by Ivan Forrester um, uh, in absolutely splendid fashion. So thank you very much, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm just going to share this, and uh, that will be our final.
Our next poem is by Ivan Forrester. Ivan Forrester, born and educated in Bovis, was not a man of the city or the coastland. He was most at home in the interior of Guyana. A Voice from Cuffey's Grave is read by Ron Bob Semple, thespian and broadcaster. Ron? Through dark jungles of subjugation, through itching swamps that drown the soul, through white streets of fire and hate, through alleys of sweat and blood, through labyrinths of conceit, I walked, wobbling in perplexity and groaning under the burden of servitude, with my head bent low, sniffing at the dust that blew from the prison of my soul, seeing only the puddles at my feet, filled with the blood from my own veins and the sweat from my own brow. I walked feeling not the heat of a kind of sun that blistered the ebony back, crisscrossed by the lashes flayed by the rise and fall of the tail of the devil, but only the hurt that oozed from dark abyss of memory and the unbearable longing for the end of years. I walked through the long distance of years and years of misery, scratched and itching from the blade of the sweet grass, fertilized by my blood and bones, blinded by black chimney smoke that mocked my freedom and stole my laughter hearing far away as in a dream, the beat of drums. Where I heard my own song and heard laughter like sweet music, where my soul roamed the heavens and my being was a slave only to my own will and to my own God. And then I raised my weary bloody head and found again my pride. As I stood there erect and noble and with my right arm raised and clenched, I saw them standing there then I heard their silence, dead silence, born of the cowardice of a bully, born of a colorless, soundless, weightless void, a silence begotten of bubbles, bubbles that burst without a sound, bubbles filled with air, free air, nothingness in a void, scarecrows on whose shoulders birds repose, elephants that lumber off at the sight of a mouse, tall giants that feel the bite of an ant. They make their noise in silence and beg, to be heard. Silence? Why don't you speak? Color, where is your tent? Atlas, where is your strength? Proud bubbles all along, I knew you floated not on a cushion of air, but trod upon dry bones and upon dry blood. But listen to the voice of the oracle of the jungles. The salt of my sweat might have flavored your mess of pottage, but my bones, though, are your taunting memory. But my blood and my battered pride may yet seek a vengeance, a vengeance! For my dark journey is ended, and I can see a faint glimmer in the sky, and a dark hand Reaching, reaching for the sun. Thank you.